Hi, y'all. Welcome. College cost challenges, the big world of college cost challenges, and this is your cowboy Christmas. Actually, cowboy Christmas was last night, and I just had to wear my cowboy outfit because uh, what else can I do besides having props uh, and crazy, crazy subjects like who's going to talk about college cost challenges but crazy bum? Okay, so I'm going to take this off because uh, Karen says the air conditioner is not working and uh, I may want to just get out of the cowboy for a second. But uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, we have a pretty full program today and I don't know if I'm going to be able to uh, fit it all in, but uh, today's program is uh, three plans, three families. But before we get into that, I'm always asked, why do we produce this crazy stuff and it's really one of one of my two major distractions at the office one is philanthropy which we're taping next and the other is what do we do about this crazy crazy college cost uh, challenge uh, world and I use this folder because tuition futures is really over 30 years ago we started a uh, uh, program actually 35 years ago talking about uh, how parents can really address this problem of college costs uh, in the future. And what we found is over the years, uh, we're not doing much. When I say we, uh, planners, uh, professional uh, advisors and so on, attorneys, accountants, insurance people, mutual fund companies, banks, we really don't do a lot. And the reason I say that is, the facts are what they are. We have $1.52 trillion of student loan debt. That doesn't count debt of parents. So we have a problem that, just go back 10 years ago, in the last decade, uh, college cost in general has doubled. When we look at the debt, the debt has almost tripled. Uh, student loan debt and so on. Uh, so if we use the rule of 72 and we say, whoa, if something doubled in a decade, uh, that means college cost has increased about 7.2%. Is that acceptable? No, but uh, I can't control that. You can't control that. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, but how can we uh, help younger families address this problem? How did we get where we are? Uh, we got where we are by saying, hey, the two-step dance is good. Two-step dance, save early, save a lot. Well, the two-step two dance doesn't work or we wouldn't have the debt that we have. Uh, where do we go from there? Well, we try to have parents who have gone through this experience uh, share with other parents and we have a book coming out and really this program uh, we restarted this from an older program that we taped here uh, and it is one of from the galley proof and what we're trying to do is uh, through each of these programs talk about a couple chapters and hopefully uh, make a, little, a few more presentations both locally uh, and nationally to advisors. So let's move ahead. We're uh, talking about three plans and three families. Three plans, no plan, an informal plan, and what we call a formalized plan or a form ed plan. No plan, these things haven't changed, like I say, in the last 30, 35, 40 years. There's a certain group of people that we can identify after the fact, after their children have graduated from college, and look back retroactively and say, okay, how did you plan? Well, we really didn't plan. That's the no plan group. And if we put all these parents together and said, let's identify those in the no plan category, there would be about 22, 24% of all parents whose children actually went to college. Okay, that's important. 
22 to 24 percent are in the no plan category. Their plan was to have a no plan. It's like having no will. I have the state's will, uh, descent and distribution uh, statute, and it says my will is the state's will. I don't have a will, but I have the state's will. In this case, we don't have a plan. That's our plan. Okay. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that, and we'll get into that later. But let's move on to the informal plan. This is the largest group. About 70, 72, 74 percent of parents fall into this category, okay? An informal plan. That's, uh, we'll save a little bit, we'll save later maybe, we'll get around to it, but eventually we'll save some. And uh, birthdays, gifts, uh, we'll get into a savings plan maybe at the bank or maybe a 529. It's kind of informal. It's uh, as you go, we'll, we'll fund. Oh, a little bit of the tax refund, uh, and not every year. Maybe we didn't get a refund every year. But uh, the bonus, maybe some of that bonus went to pay off credit cards or uh, we used it to repair the deck or our vacation or whatever. And maybe a little bit of that bonus went toward college funding, okay? Informal plan. And that's the largest of, of these, this parent category. The third plan is a formal plan, what we call a formalized or a form ed plan. And there are 4% in that group. And again, this has not changed. Our experience of working with parents hundreds and perhaps a, a few thousand, is that very, very few parents get to this four percenter. Uh, we'd like to bring more of the no plan and the informal plan over to the four percent club, uh, but how do we do that? How do we do that? Not easy, not easy. And, and what we've tried to do is uh, relate for you, and in the book we have chapters about the three plans and three families. And what we've tried to do with the three families is first and foremost is to say these are triplets, identical triplets. In every way possible, they are exactly the same. Economically, income, the house that they have, the cars that they bought, the clothes that they wear, the food that they eat, they are exactly the same. And we want you to start with that idea that these three families are exactly the same, okay? If you can later on identify with one or two or three of the, uh, the families, but really think about there's no difference with them or you, okay? Now, when we talk about the three families, okay? Uh, we talk about Peter and Paula. We talk about Steve and Sandy. Gordon or Gordy uh, and Gail. Uh, to kind of relate that in some cases, the two spouses are not on the same page as it relates to why should we save so much for college? Should we save more for retirement in lieu of or in place of, of college. Interestingly enough on that, most large percentage in the 80 percentile will say we have to save for college. And that's the group that really didn't save a lot informally, okay? Let's back up to the no plan. When it comes to college time, they have virtually nothing saved. Uh, there's no emergency fund, there's no this, there's no this. They have, in our consuming society, literally not saved anything. And it's not a surprise that when their children do go to college, that the cost, now here we have sticker price, okay? And when we look at sticker price and, and go into a, a state of, of panic, okay? 
how can college be this expensive? When I went to college, it didn't cost anything like that. This is absurd, okay? Surely we will qualify for financial aid. Well, on the financial aid part, um, we maybe have 16 to 18, maybe 20% is being the average for uh, financial aid. And that depends on the level of expense in the schools, okay? But I would, I would say a safe range is, let's say 16 to 18% may come from financial aid. But if I, if I am depending on it, it's the worst thing that I can do, okay? So when we back up for the other part, uh, we will maybe save uh, a little bit and then we'll borrow student loan, federal backed uh, subsidized loans and parent loans and so on, okay? On the informal group, uh, they did. They were successful in saving, uh, but our experience uh, with parents is that that family and the informal group were successful in saving a one and a half years of college expense. Now this is one and a half years of future college expense. That's important too. That's three semesters where they were successful. This informal group of 72 to 74 percent of parents, they were successful in saving about three percent, or three semesters, excuse me, of college cost. Now, important, this is for the first child. Three semesters for the first child. And anything that we've saved, we kind of earmark that for the first child. Let me interject, and we'll talk about this in a future program. This is not a per child challenge. This is a family challenge. And we've got to have that in, in our uh, mindset that as we go through life, different cycles, and we, we grow, the family may grow. And where we were saving for uh, little Joni, Tommy comes along, and maybe Sarah after that. So it's not treating each of those children separately and funding separately. This is a family problem, okay? We'll come back to that, and I didn't mean to even talk about that today. But the informal group, uh, they have good intentions, okay? And Gordy and Gail, good intents, uh, they, meant, they meant well. They're discerning parents. They're, they're conscious of the, the effort, the challenge, and they do try to save, okay? But there are so many other factors that come into play that hurt them that we, we need to talk about. And that's really one of the primary purposes of the book, uh, how we address these, these challenges. Because along the way, we think we're going to be uh, the exception. A and the number of parents that, that believe that their situation is going to be exceptional, everyone thinks that they're going to be the exception. Um, my little Emma, she's going to be a superstar. She's going to get a scholarship in music or gymnastics or soccer or lacrosse. And Sonny, he's going to get a scholarship. Or we're going, to go, we're going to qualify for the biggest financial aid package because our combined income, sh surely the expected family contribution, uh, they can't expect us to pay all of this bill, can they? We're the exception. Everybody is the exception. Wrong. Wrong, wrong. $1.52 trillion growing in student loan debt. So if we're aware of that, then maybe we're closer to solutions or possible solutions. One of the quotes, and in, in, uh, I'll try in each of these programs, as we do in each of the chapters, uh, try to quote uh, a family or a couple uh, that say, hey, uh, you're right. You were right in that seminar. It's a humbling experience. 
one of the quotes. Another quote, uh, I think out in uh, Ohio or Missouri, uh, said, uh, it's not important what you know. <laughs> Stop, pause, or whatever. Or the other quote that goes with that, we didn't know what we didn't know. Now that, that's kind of a, a sad commentary on the planning industry. And it's interesting that out of the entire industry, uh, hundreds of thousands uh, that, that claim to be financial planners, there's really a half a dozen of players. And those players are out speaking, they're writing, they have subscriptions, they have training programs for other advisors. That this is a great part, uh, a segment to put into your business. This is a segment that's been ignored for a long time. Perhaps you have a young planner in your, your firm, that a uh, millennial or Xer or whatever, that uh, boy, if you train them, if you have them with a credential of college planning, uh, this will help your business and so on. It'll help them get into the business and get their legs in the business. The problem is we kind of devote our training to what I call the panic and crisis stage of parenthood. And that is, it's not property and casualty, it's panic and crisis, P and C, okay? The panic and crisis starts at probably at the end, mid or end of the sophomore year in high school. And oh my goodness, uh, Polly over here is going to college pretty soon. And by junior year, we're going to seminars, we're going to the high school, we're visiting with guidance counselors and so on and saying, are you serious about what college costs, okay? And another program we'll get into uh, the danger of calculators. And I, th I really think in assessing this, this bigger picture and a bigger problem, is that uh, these calculators that everybody has, the internet is a fountain of information. And we have a whole section on DIYs, do-it-yourselfers, that uh, all this information, I, I don't need planning, okay? Formal planning uh, advisors. I can get all this information and with the calculators, I can tell how much it costs and oh, by the way, this one calculator said that I had to save $4,200 a month for our three children. $4,200 a month where free cash flow at the end of each month uh, it doesn't come anywhere near that. So we have a lot of problems and, and we want to address those. But let's get back to the three plans and the three families. Steve and Sandy struggles are the family that we have named for no plan, okay? They're not different than most other families. It's just the different stage, the different mindset, maybe uh, how they were raised, how they went to college, what their parents uh, and friends and associates did, and it's kind of get them into um, a cubby hole, if you will, of, of how I am going to treat this problem, okay? But Steve and Sandy's struggles are, remember, remember please, are no different from the other two families. That's very important. They are identical triplets. Husband, identical with all the, these other two uh, husband. Wife, identical. And all three of the spouses are identical. Same income, same college, same background, same, same everything, okay? So Steve and Sandy's struggles are, are the same, are the same as Gordy and Gail, uh, good and tense. And they are the same as Peter and Paula uh, plan wells, uh, well plans. The, the issue here is What's missing? Well, there are a lot of things that are missing. We didn't know what we didn't know, uh, going back to that quote. And, and we'll talk about that in the future programs. But, uh, and there are several. There are several that if, if they're taking, if they're accepted, if they bought into uh, going from the two-step dance to the seven-step, 
uh, and, and I'm aware that the seven steps are important. I'm aware that it's, it will get me from the no plan to the informal plan. And hopefully, many will become members of the, of the 4% club. But it's, it's um, the H factor. The H factor is habit. Now, that's common sense, isn't it? Intuitively, I know that habits, there are good habits and bad habits. And if I develop a good habit, uh, that will help me. But how do we get from point A to point Q and say it all depends on habits? Well, that's wishful thinking. Uh, the other is uh, craziness with, with money and the big step missing there and with the smartest, the most intelligent, the most experienced executive, research, science, uh, judge, attorney, doctor, whatever, whatever, okay? They miss, the commonly, they miss the secret of compounding. And that permeates through, through all of the saving. If we can say to parents, develop some, some good habits and connect the dots, that it will save you at least $10,000 per year, per student, for every year in college. That's a lot of money with the same dollars, the same dollars. And what's the end result? The end result is we have parent and student with fewer loans. We have parents who have a much better uh, series of options with respect to retirement. They have more money at retirement. They have more options to retire perhaps earlier than uh, if they were carrying this no plan or informal plan and so on. So there is motivation. And if parents are aware of the dollar uh, benefit that future stages uh, of life are easier uh, with the H factor, the habit forming factor, uh, We'll, we'll talk about these, uh, these three families. We'll, we'll talk about the importance of uh, what they did, what they did common and similar ways, and what they did just a little bit different, just a little bit different, okay? Uh, in the seven-step uh, dance, we call it, versus the two-step that doesn't work. Save early, save a lot. The fourth stage, is very, very critical. And we want to devote a lot of time in future programs to this fourth stage. Our program, a couple of programs ago, we talked about uh, Ted G. And Ted was a grandfather in Toledo, Ohio, that owned uh, two or three uh, furniture stores. And he was concerned about three granddaughters. His two daughters, one was a uh, teacher. I'm not sure if she was an elementary teacher or junior high. And another uh, daughter was a social worker. And grandfather Ted, Ted G, knew that uh, his family, his children, were going to have a difficult time uh, as far as paying for, for future college costs. So Ted G, Ted grandfather, said, uh, hey, what, what can I do uh, to uh, contribute or help them? And we set him up on. <laughs> He wanted a lump sum, and I said, no, 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 not a lump sum. Let's, this with the grandfather, let's have a habit, an automatic habit of saving of $25 a month per, per grandchild, three granddaughters. Oh, that's not going to be enough. That's not going to be enough. So uh, he finally, uh, after I hit him over the head several times, uh, said, okay, let's start this. Every year, we came back and said, can you afford another $5 a month? He laughed. He laughed. And we still use it today and call it the nickel plan, that if we periodically review, and that's stage four, monitor and periodically review, and you incorporate two important parts, the nickel plan and what we call the FAPR, the Financial Aid Probability Analysis Report. If we can develop this habit around monitoring, tweaking, and keeping up to date, 
uh, we're a long, long way of, of solving some of our college cost challenges, a long way. And in fact, many, many, many parents end up evolving into that 4% four, four club, and I have a smiley uh, under that category that they had a good experience. It was humbling, but they had a good experience in respect to better than the neighbor on each side where they live or the colleague that they uh, visit with at uh, the office. Uh, gee, we didn't get the financial aid that we thought we were going to get. We have to borrow. We have to borrow more on our home equity line. We even have some people that say, gee, we, had to, we, had, we didn't want to, but we had to borrow on our 401k for uh, the second or third child or whatever, okay? These are preventable, preventable uh, problems. Uh, it's just that we, we have to take a little time each year, 15 minutes, half an hour, maybe a half an hour of my time each year to review and monitor what my plan is. Oh, by the way, step one is a written plan. And we'll get into uh, what is a part of the, of the written plan. I wanted to share with you real quickly uh, a couple of trips that I uh, had that uh, contributed to the development and, uh, of the nickel plan. One was in Sylvania, Ohio. I went out there for a structured settlement uh, personal injury tort liability case and uh, connected with some old friends, did a presentation for the PTO there, and we talked about the nickel plan. We talked about Ted, the grandfather, uh, who not, not that many years before that, but uh, we kind of formulated uh, how to uh, address this, and it's amazing out of that original group in the PTO, we have a number a fair number in the 4% club. Another trip, very quickly, uh, it started in, in Warren, Ohio, where I was born and raised, and a friend of mine that uh, we clerked at a law firm called me in on another uh, personal injury case, he ended up uh, uh, medical malpractice, and we went over to Niles, Ohio, just down the road, that Niles, Ohio ended up in Sharon, Pennsylvania. Sharon, Pennsylvania ended up in Newcastle, Pennsylvania and Beavers Falls. And I found out that uh, the teacher in Sharon uh, knew uh, a fellow that was uh, playing football that was a wrestling coach. And it ended up that uh, his brother uh, and I played against each other in an in all-star Ohio, uh, Northeast Ohio and Western Pennsylvania football game. Uh, it all came out of this that uh, they too uh, kind of gravitated and accepted and it resonated that uh, uh, the nickel plan and the financial aid probability analysis report uh, was coming in. I've enjoyed visiting with you. I said we had a lot to cover. We have a lot more to cover in the future. Uh, we'll see you next time and enjoy that Cowboy Texas Christmas. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.